Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes here for Clark College's Network Technology Department with another Cisco lecture, this for the CCNA 4 class, Chapter 6, Broadband Technologies. We're going to take a look at teleworking, an upcoming phenomenon in our country and worldwide, and we're going to compare different broadband solutions and talk about configuring different versions of DSL technology. Summarize and done. Objectives for this chapter. Talk about teleworking. Teleworking is conducting work where you're not in the workplace. You're at a remote location, possibly your house, a coffee shop, um, a library, some other location. You might, uh, you might actually be at a customer uh, site. So we have some teleworkers are uh, working from customer locations. So they've been basically stationed there at a, uh, at a high cap customer to provide some on-site uh, support and they uh, work from that location. So to make that work, we have to employ a number of technologies, uh, VPN, voice over IP and video conferencing, and of course, a lot of mobile device technology. Studies have shown improved employee productivity. So this is interesting and something I like to bring up with employers who are uh, nervous about having someone work from home, be it full-time or part-time. A lot of our area employers are on board with the idea of folks working from home one day a week, which is great. 20% of your work week, uh, generally Fridays are very popular with employees. They work from home, uh, cuts down on the commute. And studies have shown you're actually more productive than uh, working in the office. So your productivity will actually increase, which is a bonus to the employer. Also, of course, uh, there are reduced costs and expenses. I don't provide you a desk, a parking space. I don't have to have enough bathrooms and break areas and, you know, uh, cuts down on heating and cooling, so forth. So a lot of companies uh, have goals to have up to half of their workforce working from home by 2020. It also uh, is a benefit to employees, obviously, and uh, that eases recruitment and retention. Imagine, for instance, that you're trying to find a hard to find engineer, maybe it's a HTML5 a coder. Those are still hard to get right now with HTML5 uh, rolling out on the internet. There is a lot of demand for good coders. So if I could offer someone to work from home, I can recruit nationally or internationally and uh, you know, have, have folks work for me and they never have to physically come into work is a big bonus. Of course, you have reduced absenteeism. We find that people that work from home uh, show up to work even when they don't feel well, even when they, you know, have a bad cold, things like that. Uh, of course, they don't risk getting other people sick and they don't have that commute. Uh, they can, you know, be in there in the comfort of their home because they're usually using mobile technology. They might be able to relocate that to an area that's that's more suitable. Uh, of course, they have improved morale. Um, they can pick kids up from school. They can, uh, you know, interact with a family pet, things like that. They have improved corporate citizenship. We find that they're more involved in the community and involved in, um, you know, initiatives that the company has uh, to promote itself and the goodwill of the company. Of course, they have improved customer service as well. Government benefits. So, now let's take it up a notch. All right, we know it's good for the employee. We know that teleworking is good for some businesses, for some companies, it's going to be a win-win. But often we forget about our government, right? It's good for the United States. It helps build a sustainable economy. I mean, think about it as we get more and more people and we want to get more people to work. If all those people are driving to and from work, it puts a strain on the roads and uh, then you have to build more bigger roads, right? And you have to have more parking and more more infrastructure. And that costs money not only to build it, but to maintain it. So one way to speed up growth is to not have to do all that. And so it helps build a sustainable economy. It reduces traffic problems and other issues with uh, congestion. 
it increases productivity, which is an indicator of how successful an economy is, is how productive that workforce is. It alleviates symptoms of the digital divide, right? Because you no longer have people that don't use tech, right? These are technically savvy people. You have to be more technically savvy to work remotely. You have to have some uh, cursory understanding, at least a user understanding of the technology that you're using. It reduces costs and expenses. It improves flexibility. It attracts growth and development. And it also keeps money in the communities where people live. That's not on this list, but that's one that's high on my uh, radar. So people who work from home, they eat lunch near their home. They do things near their home. They spend money near their home. They invest in things near their home instead of near their place of work, right? If you're place bound, then you're probably stopping for groceries on your way home from work. You're probably doing uh, lunch with coworkers near where you work, not near where you live. So it changes dynamically the um, investments that are made and really helps strengthen the communities where these folks live and make them uh, nicer, more attractive places. So it's really kind of a win for government as well. Individual benefits, of course, um, You'll read all about that, this chapter, and, uh, you know, I think that's the easy one to conceptualize because we're all individuals. We're like, oh, yeah, I'd love to work from home, right? There's a lot of, some of us don't want to work from home. We go to the library or somewhere, but you, um, you have a lot of cost savings and you are going to be a happier, happier person because it's going to help with that work-life uh, balance. Community benefits increases the value of real estate, helps with a lot of different uh, things, attracts growth and development, more people working from home, buy more broadband connections, ISPs invest more in fiber and up the internet speeds in the area. It's a, you know, it just kind of grows uh, on you. It, it's really a, a different way of looking at a economies and, and how they develop. And in America, we have a lot of rural areas. And if you think about the job prospects for someone, say, in a farming town, um, you know, that maybe there's no tech in that town. And they really like living there. They grew up there. Their grandparents grew up there. Uh, they kind of wanted to live in that community. But they're thinking, man, I, I really like tech. And I'm going to have to move to a big city to do that, I guess. Well, in the new economy, that may not be the case. Uh, they may have to initially because we found a lot of companies just won't let uh, kind of uh, people starting in their career start out in teleworking. But folks with a couple years experience, they trust them more. They go, OK, it looks like you, you know your stuff. We'll let you work from home. They would have a real opportunity then to work in the neighborhoods and communities that they want to live in. Let's talk about the drawbacks. Obviously, anything with that many pros, there must be something wrong with it, right? So it's more uh, difficult to track employee progress, right? Because you never see them, right? You don't have someone sitting at a desk. So that's more uh, difficult to track that. And you have to um, train your managers on how to manage uh, people that work from home. So it can be tracked. So by more difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. There are a lot of proven ways to track people that work um, remotely on projects and that's again being done more and more now, but you do have to do some retraining of your supervisory and management uh, folks. To, you have to manage those people in a different way, right? It's no longer did you are you showing up at time and sitting at your seat. It's um, a lot of it usually measured on goals and productivity, right? Are you are you meeting your deadlines? Are you getting uh, the amount of work done that a uh, comparable worker in the office space is? So yeah, you make some kind of uh, bars, right? Some measurement bars that they have to attain and they need to know what those are, right? And they need to have a way they can track their progress towards them. And okay, let's talk about the drawbacks for the individual. You might feel isolated, right? You, you know, uh, you're probably taking this class from me as an online class and you probably feel a little bit that way at least, maybe somewhat that way. An online class is very similar to this. You are going to feel more isolated. You're not hanging out with a bunch of uh, co-workers, right? You're you're meeting them online. You're communicating with them through text and email and, and uh, social media. And you find it takes longer to get to know people in a remote environment. Um, sometimes uh, some of the people I've worked with, uh, I can think of 
uh, one Christy Hughes, who I, I work closely with, has taken me three or four years. I finally met her in person at a conference and, um, you know, first time in three or four years of working on almost a daily basis, but we work remotely in different, uh, different parts of the country on projects. So it can be a lot slower to build those connections or even get noticed by management, right? So talk about promotions and things like that. You kind of blend into the background. People look at your work product, they don't really see you. So that can be a problem. Also individuals like I would find can get really distracted. I had to set up a, a place in my home that uh, my other co-inhabitants of my house have to be respectful of not entering that area during my work times. So otherwise you could have a lot of distractions. It's easy to get distracted at your house. There's a lot going on. You have all your toys there. You have you know, people you love and care about there. You have a lot of things that you could distract yourself with. Okay, but to make it work from our standpoint, we're technologists, we just went, okay, well, that's all great. It's great to look at that stuff and think about it. But that's, that's like what a sociologist would look at, right? What do we care, right? We want to get down to the nuts and bolts. How do I make it work? So if a company decides they're going to have teleworkers, how, how do I provision that and manage that for them? What kind of technologies do I need? Well, you need broadband. Yeah, I mean, you just can't do this over dial-up. So you're going to have to have some type of broadband connection. You're going to have to have a way to secure that connection. So we're talking about a VPN. Maybe IPsec, maybe not. There's other VPN technologies. IPsec's just an example they're putting out here. Um, you know, we see a lot of SSL VPNs, layer seven VPNs, uh, you know, that would be HTTPS. Um, IPsec is a layer three VPN. There are a lot of different VPN technologies. MPLS is another one that we see used uh, frequently. And you're gonna have traditional private WAN technologies. So you might have things like T1s, point-to-point uh, -point links, um, things like that being implemented. So first you have to start with what the connectivity requirements are. You have to say, okay, what's being transmitted? I mean, is, is there gonna be video? Is there gonna be a VoIP phone? And what, what type of work is being done on the computer? And you have to really kind of figure out what your bandwidth needs are. And do you need to encrypt this stuff? Is it, is it sensitive? So if it's you know sensitive work, it, it needs to be encrypted. Let's compare some broadband solutions. Lots of broadband solutions out there, right? And in the United States, we're going to see a lot of cable and DSL at the remote site, right? So you from the head end office are probably going to have something like fiber, um, you know, some type of uh, OC, uh, you know, optical carrier connection or T1s or something of that nature. And then those are those are going to connect your uh, main company to your ISP. But this is this is just looking at okay, that's how you get to the internet, right? That's how you get to your ISP at the main office. But how do your remote teleworkers get to the internet, right? Because you're going to find each other out there on the internet is what we typically do. And to do that, um, they're going to need an internet connection as well. And cable is a predominant one. So cable is based on cable television, CATV. And it's called DOCSIS. And so cable internet is called D-O-C-S-I-S, DOCSIS. And DOCSIS uh, technology is using a, a thick piece of copper coaxial cable with an F-type barrel connector that you screw on, right? Usually to a cable modem, which is really a router. And that connects the devices in your home to the cable network. And you can see here one drawback of cable is they daisy chain all the homes up and down your street together. So one problem with cable is you can't get guaranteed bandwidth. You can get an up to, you can get a promise that you'll get up to a certain bandwidth and you pay more money, you get a higher promise that you might attain up to, right? Uh, a higher bandwidth, but they don't guarantee a minimum. They don't say you'll get at least this much bandwidth, they can't because it's shared with your neighbors. So if you all get on at the same time, you're gonna get really terribly slow bandwidth. Let's take a look at cable in the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum is that frequency spectrum of where frequencies travel. It could be electrical frequency or even light. Light and electricity are all on the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, so this uh, dictates fiber optics, this dictates your radio waves, you know, for everything from Wi-Fi to cellular, and also 
um, current, electrical current going down a wire. And if you didn't know, um, because they're all on the electromagnetic spectrum, they're all the same energy. So they can be converted fairly easily from one to another. So electricity can be turned into radio waves and radio waves to light and so forth. So they're all really the same energy, just in different frequencies on the spectrum. So there's your electric energy. And what it's basically getting at is um, where all these technologies come from. They just develop them off of the spectrum of frequencies. So we have things called microwave uh, and those are microwave towers, which can send a um, radio signal and uh, that can go a good number of miles and uh, those are expensive and, and big companies would have microwave. Uh, you may have an infrared remote at home to communicate with your TV and you may notice on a sunny day uh, when the sun's coming in the window at your home, the infrared remote has difficulty connecting, but infrared is, is, a, um, is a light band that we use generally not too much. We, we like to uh, stay in most of the visible uh, waves with things like lasers. A lot of our fiber optic lasers are up in you know red, green, blue, different colors within the uh, visible range. But we do have you know ultraviolet, x-ray, um, gamma, cosmic rays. We're not using those yet, but you know cosmic rays, or you may not know, cosmic rays can travel very long distances. So that might in the future be some other things we figure out how to send and receive on this spectrum. So it's very exciting that we're not done. We haven't, we haven't kind of run out of possibilities and how we communicate. So DOCSIS again is the cable technology that um, the cable companies use, be it uh, Cox Cable or Comcast or any of the others. They use a standardized uh, way of sending internet signals and it's uh, a data over cable system. So what they've done with the cable company lately is they've been pushing fiber closer and closer to your home. So that used to be you had that big coaxial cable went all the way back to the head end office, which is where they have all the computers and uh, actually usually microwave and satellite dishes and other kinds of things there. Well, now they run fiber optic cabling all the way out into your community. It may even get to the end of your street and then everyone on your street is sitting on a big thick um, coaxial copper cable uh, from what's called the node. So the node is going to convert the fiber into copper. Okay, let's look at DSL. So DSL is a competing technology. It's older than the cable technology and it's uh, perceived usually as slower and that just means lower bandwidths. Um, it does have advantages. It typically doesn't get congested because you're not, um, you're not daisy chained with the other homes on your street. So you have a direct, uh, direct connection um, all the way back to what's called the D-SLAM, which is the switch. From there, you are obviously, you are um, competing with your neighbors and with everyone else on the you know, trunk lines coming out of that switch, but all the way to the switch. So it's uh, perhaps more secure as well. So it's a little better security and maybe a little more um, consistent bandwidth. They still generally don't guarantee the bandwidth with DSL. And DSL is very distance limited. So if you don't live within a couple miles, you're not gonna get it. It doesn't have a long distance it can, it can do. Um, some DSL technologies can only go a mile or less, some not even a mile. And uh, about the farthest you can see here is about 3.39 miles or five and a half kilometers is about the maximum that you could get. And at that distance, you're going to get something like 256 kilobits per second. So very slow to get the SDSLs, the higher speed DSLs, you're going to have to be very close to these DSLAMs. Okay, and it would look something like this. So you have to put little filters on all your phone lines because DSL was going to use the existing phone lines, which is a 50 year plus old technology, little tiny copper wires designed to carry analog um, voice signal, human voice. And we've adapted them to send high speed digital signal. And so we have to put little filters on anything that is still an analog device. So if you still have some, you know, traditional telephones in your home or a fax machine or anything like that, answering machine, you need to put a little filter on them. 
and they usually look like a little dongle. And the reason for that is that filter will block the high-speed digital signal, which could actually damage that analog device because it's not designed to understand that signal. So the signal not only could create uh, unpleasant noises in the earpiece if you picked up that device, but it could actually destroy your phone or uh, more likely your answering machine or other sensitive equipment. So it's very important to put the filters. There's no need to put the filter on your digital connection because it's going to connect through your DSL modem, which is really a router. And your DSL modem has a filter that's backwards and strips off the analog signal, right? So if you have an analog signal coming in, it would strip that off. And these little filters are used with something called ADSL, which is the type of DSL where you can still have an analog phone. So you get both DSL and analog phone on the same copper wire. With SDSL, we um, can get rid of the filters. We no longer have analog phone then. Your phones would be voice over IP phones, so no filters needed because voice over IP phones are digital and they could, they could plug right in through the uh, DSL modem. But we spend a lot of time talking about ADSL because ADSL is predominantly the type you find in a home. If you were to call and sign up for DSL, usually ADSL is the only type available at your home. Businesses will more uh, commonly get a choice between that and SDSL. And ADSL just means asymmetric. Uh, DSL means that you get higher bandwidth coming into your home than you do going out of your home. With symmetric DSL, you get the same bandwidth up and down. Your up and down bandwidth speeds are, are symmetrical. And uh, the reason it's asymmetric with ADSL is they steal some of that digital bandwidth capacity to allow the analog signal, the legacy phone signal, still travels over that wire. So the DSL kind of moves itself up into a frequency the phone doesn't use. The phone is going to use uh, around 0 to 4,000 hertz of frequency on that piece of copper. So ADSL restricts itself to above 4,000 hertz. That way it's in a different frequency area and the two never know the other ones there. They travel in different lanes, if you will, frequency on that copper wire. Let's move on to a new technology. This is just really a quick dip on different technologies. Uh, I spent more time on cable and DSL because those are more commonly found, but you might have municipal Wi-Fi. Some cities, you can hop on uh, free or low-cost Wi-Fi that's available right in your neighborhood and you can sign up for that. We have some towns here and, and some folks that live in urban areas in the downtown that can take advantage of this. Another, uh, another is a type of, of uh, high-speed um, cellular called WiMAX, and WiMAX is a um, way to push out a cellular signal for, uh, for digital. And you may have heard of that. It's, it's kind of falling out of popularity with 4G and now 5G coming. They're reaching the speeds that WiMAX used to reach, and they're doing that right over the cellular network. So these are uh, different broadband wireless technologies that you might see. So that's your 3G, 4G, and 5G is coming um, in 2018. In fact, AT&T is rolling out a, a pre-5G technology now. They want to be the first one to market. Satellite implementations. So that would be another one. Besides cellular, you might use satellite. Satellite is probably the least popular. We call it a last-ditch technology. So depending on where you live, you might be able to get cellular, you might not. There's a lot of rural areas where, yeah, sure, cellular phones work, but they don't get any cellular data, or if they do, it's what's called edge, very, very slow. The original iPhone was an edge device, so really old, slow technology. So if you don't have um, cable and DSL and cellular available, Satellite might be your only um, option. Satellite is great because you can get it pretty much anywhere you can get a view of the sky. So you just mount a dish on your roof and you have a transceiver box that turns it into an ethernet signal. And um, so that's, that's pretty much uh, the satellite. The problem with satellite is one, it's expensive for, the, uh, for what you get. And so not only does it cost more and require uh, special equipment like the dish, it uh, has a really long delay of up to two seconds of delay. So that would be 
10 100 10 100 right two 10 100s and so you're going to have significant delay so imagine a web browser and you clicking a link and going click 10 101 10 102 boom there's your page that's pretty slow we expect to click a link and it just pops right it just goes to the next page so satellite is is good when you don't have other options So now what you want to do is kind of compare them. I mean, the, the reality is there's no perfect solution here. It's choosing the solution based on what's available in your area and comparing that to what your needs are. Remember the needs that we looked at of the teleworker, what kind of things will I be sending and which of the available technologies would best fit what I'm trying to do. Let's talk about configuring DSL. So most commonly, uh, DSL is going to be used with PPP. So we've already, you know, studied the PPP protocol, and I alluded in that chapter that PPP is often combined on other protocols. So in the case of DSL, we're going to use PPP over Ethernet. And what this is going to be used for essentially is to um, have PPP be the frame that connects us to the ISP. So essentially it creates a PPP tunnel from us to the ISP across our ethernet and through the DSL connection. And what's nice about PPP and why they like it on the provider side is they can do authentication. So they can do PAP or CHAP authentication with PPP. They also have quality of service, they have compression, they can uh, do multi-link with PPP. So they could sell you two or three different um, DSL connections and then PPP could multi-link them together to get aggregate bandwidth that's higher. So that's a one way to get higher bandwidth in your home would be to, uh, you may have two lines, right? You might have, uh, usually the phone company has run at least two lines of cable into your home. Uh, some homes have three and even four lines of, uh, of copper cabling coming in that could support up to four different phone numbers. They can take those and bundle them together in a special um, modem, DSL modem that would have three or four, even four ports, and they plug in the different DSL connections and create a, a PPP multi-link uh, tunnel. So PPP, as we learned, has a lot of features that really can be utilized well with DSL technology. Okay, let's summarize. We explored the various broadband solutions used by teleworkers and branch office workers. We outlined the features and basic infrastructure behind each broadband technology, which enables a network manager to make an informed selection. We identified DSL cable and other broadband wireless options as the various broadband solutions, and we described basic DSL configuration. I want to add here a couple emerging things that aren't covered uh, yet by Cisco. In fact, they're, they're not even here, but they're coming and they're worth looking at and keeping an eye on. There's a renaissance coming in broadband connectivity options for the end user. And we should be aware of those and be looking at what's happening. Facebook is working on solar power gliders that would send a Wi-Fi signal over areas. So the glider would just stay up there for one to two years flying around solar powered and broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal. So it asks as a, a flying Wi-Fi hotspot, if you will. So that's interesting idea. And um, Google has a similar idea. What they plan to do is stake a, um, a balloon. Uh, these, are, these are big like dirigible balloons that would be a wireless access point. And those balloons would stay up there for years, two to five years. They, the balloon would just stay up there and have um, a tether that holds it to the ground, holds it in place, and it would just float up there in the, in the atmosphere and provide a 100, 200, 300 mile radius of um, Wi-Fi broadband. So these are, these are various ways that we're looking at that. In fact, they're already using those balloons for various sporting events, maybe on a golf course or at a stadium game or somewhere where they need to get a lot of wireless signal. Um, and they can put these balloons up and, and create an ad hoc wireless uh, network whenever they want. So they're already technologies that are proven. And a further out one, a company called SpaceX, you may be familiar with Tesla, the electric cars, and Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, is also CEO of another company called SpaceX that's been launching rockets up to the International Space Station lately. And 
They have a side project which are called sat cubes, and these are little disposable satellites the size of a beach ball. And they want to launch hundreds of them into the lower atmosphere. So that's LEO, the low Earth orbit. And they would float around up there for weeks or months uh, before they burned up in the atmosphere. And the idea is they would act as wireless uh, access points for maybe even whole countries, right? And so they could take care of um, the broadband needs in huge swaths of area because of their altitude. So that's a pretty way out there idea, but these CubeSats are kind of the new thing in satellites, cheap disposable satellites that are small and, um, and easy to deploy and build. So these are three different technologies that are emerging and being uh, promoted by some of our large companies like Facebook, Google, and SpaceX that are worth keeping an eye on. And there's more out there. I just list some of the kind of mainstream ones. There are ones like putting uh, broadband over power lines. So that's an idea the power companies are backing. There's already a big thick power cable coming into our homes and the power company's already proven that they can send a high speed internet signal over the power line into your home. So that's a technology they have it in, uh, I think, about three cities around the country already. So these are emerging technologies that aren't ready for you or me to sign up for right now. But as technologists, I think uh, one of our jobs is keeping an eye on, on what's going on out there and coming down the pipe. Thank you very much. Have a great week.